My name is Alicia Middleman. I'm a curator at the Estes Park Museum. Today is December 6, 2013. We are at the museum interviewing Ray Northcutt for an interview in the Estes Valley Mountaineering Oral History Project. This is a joint venture between the Estes Valley Library and the Estes Park Museum. What is your full name? Raymond Earl Northcutt. And Ray, where were you born? Emporia, Kansas, December 13th, 1930. What were your favorite things to do when you were younger? Hmm. <laughs> Good grief. So much of it I've forgotten, but I uh, had a cat I played with. <laughs> I spent time on uh, a farm, my uncle's farm. I liked animals, still do. Uh, got into guns early. <laughs> Red Rider BB gun when I was seven, I believe. And uh, that tracked out into more serious items. But, uh, I'm not an NRA member or anything like that, uh, but uh, it uh, guns, to some extent, still hold a fascination for me. But uh, right now, my preference is my bow. <laughs> uh, hmm. I haven't really thought of my childhood. I, my early. Upbringing was, uh, I was raised a Quaker, actually. And so that had a profound influence on me, and to some extent still does. Uh, it's a very uncomplicated religion. And when you grow up with that, I mean, as a young child, I mean, it hangs with you for a long time, actually. Emporia, Kansas, then, was a very small farming town. And uh, it's changed like everything else. <laughs> Did you enlist in the military straight out of high school? No, I, uh, I went to Kansas State University in Manhattan straight out of, uh, I was the class of 49, Topeka High School. We moved to the big city uh, when the war came along. <clears throat> And uh, I finished Topeka High School, went straight into college, and uh, I was with a reserve unit at, at the time. And uh, when the Korean War came along, I thought about uh, leaving and en enlisting right away, but they said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. You'll just be, this thing isn't going to amount to much. You'll dig, spend most of your time digging, digging latrines, and I thought, well, probably know what they're talking about, but it turned out to be a little different from that. But uh, they encouraged me to stay. Yeah. But uh, I uh, got a crazy bug in me along about 50, 1950, I guess it was. 51. I uh, had made a trip to uh, Boulder. Looking into maybe going to school there, and it uh, was just too expensive. I thought, well, later. But I got that's when I began to get the idea of climbing. I looked up at the flat irons and a few other, a few other formations and what have you. And uh, and I, when I went back to Kansas, I thought, hmm, this isn't really isn't the place I want to spend the rest of my life. So uh, I and I'd seen a movie. Uh, I think it was called uh, "The White Tower" with Lloyd Bridges, and uh, you've probably seen it. But um, I uh, thought, hey, that that looks neat. But, uh, I thought I, uh, I'll try that sometime. So I got the idea. I built my grades up to a point. Uh, my last spring at K State. Uh, 52, actually. And I would uh, 
I'd uh, skip classes on Friday and hop on a bus and, and uh, go out to Denver. And I found out about the Colorado Mountain Club, et cetera, and they had a climbing school. And uh, I entered that. And for every weekend, I forget how, probably five or six weeks, I was commuting back and forth between Manhattan and Denver. <laughs> they had the climbing school up at Turkey Creek Canyon. And uh, so that's, that was a, the beginning, the starting of my, my climbing experience. Uh, and uh, after I finished the, that semester, spring semester of 50, 1952, I decided I've had it with this, this area. So I moved, actually moved to uh, Denver and uh, where I could climb and I started DU and soon found out that was a terribly expensive situation and uh, eventually got so expensive that I, I thought, well, I quit school, joined the military. And uh, meanwhile, I, I had done what <clears throat> a few things necessary to hopefully get into the 10th Mountain Division, the Mountain Troops. You had to have, it's one of those unique outfits in the Army, you, uh, you had to have references and, uh, to get in. And uh, so I, I got those. I'd done some, some climbing uh, before uh, that as well. I was with uh, the Colorado Mountain Club and in the school, et cetera, et cetera. And I got my letters of re recommendation and all I could do at the time was just put it in the mail. There was no auto, nothing automatic about it. So uh, I took uh, actually my uh, basic infantry training was uh, at Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, it looks like they shipped me out to, uh, what was the name of the place? Camp near Fort Dix, I can't even rem remember it now. Fort Monmouth, it was a communication school. And it looks like I was stuck in that direction, but one day my first sergeant came to me and says, Ray, you have orders to go, go back to a place uh, called uh, Camp Carson, Colorado. So bam, I was gone. <laughs> and I uh, spent, um, that was the spring of uh, 53, I guess it was, 50, no, 54, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the Army proceeded to t teach us uh, the military method of climbing because our, our uh, assignment would be to teach other troops to climb and uh, the military way. So we spent probably six weeks, and all of us were ex-climbers for the most part, and, and uh, Basically, that's it. That's how I, that was, we would uh, teach climbing in Cheyenne Canyon and we'd give demonstrations to generals who would come through from Iran or some other place. Uh, we'd have a, on one side of the canyon, across from the bleachers would be, there was a tower and uh, I was one of the, two of us, a two-man team, uh, Andy and myself, we, had, we wore over whites, so we'd stick out like <laughs> as we leapfrogged from the bottom base to the top and uh, did that every day for a summer, actually. Then when the fall approached, uh, we moved to Camp Hale. And that, at that point, we began. They taught us the military method of skiing, and I'd done some skiing by that time, so. Anyway, uh, as the winter moved in, we, uh, we were settled in our James Way huts and, and uh, going out on maneuvers and what have you. And eventually we'd, a unit would come in. As I recall, I think the 82nd Airborne came in and uh, we taught them how to ski the military way and, if they, and beyond that if they wanted. So. Ray, can you tell me a little bit more? What is the military way of climbing? very, very safe. <laughs> uh, you use, uh, it's just basically the, uh, 
Let me think this out. It's been so long. <laughs> I'm trying to recall the dimension of the rope, a very, very thick, heavy rope. With the establishment of a belayer on a very safe ledge, anchored in completely, you uh, take maybe a as I recall, about a 20-foot lead at the most. And uh, you don't take long, you didn't take long leads in the military, if you had a choice, actually. And uh, that's basically it, the, the, the way we climb, except that the military really didn't uh, attempt really serious climbing. Uh, it was serious to them, actually. But uh, it was pretty run-of-the-mill. Uh, I'm not that fam familiar with the classifications. There's so many of them now that I don't know what they're talking about when they say a 510 or a 514. I don't know. But we, we didn't bother with those things. But I'd say the climbing we did, uh, there was always a ledge someplace. Cracks galore. I mean, they didn't choose a bare wall uh, to... Uh, they'd find a better way to do it, go around it. I mean, they'd find an, the easiest route of it. Uh, in contrast to uh, some of us who, after we got out, we'd, we'd look for the difficult routes, the well, challenges. Were a lot of these routes multi-pitch? Yeah. Uh, not, um, let's see, the tower in Cheyenne Canyon was one, two, three, four, maybe, five pitches. I mean, five leads. Le we called it leapfrogging, actually. And I mean, admittedly, you, you had to be careful if you, no matter how easy they were, if you fell, you were, <laughs> you, you were history. I mean, it, uh, you don't fall off anything, ideally. And we had people fall. I mean, it was not a safe, was not the safest line of work by anybody's. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, did our level best to teach people uh, the safe way to climb. There was always, uh, your best climber would take the lead, of course. And uh, there was always uh, a rope above from that point forth. I mean, to the, if it were a two or a three-man party, uh, a three-man party is a pain in the neck, I can't imagine. I did it once. and. Uh, but we had to, uh, at first, the instructors would lead totally and uh, show them how to anchor in, how to drive pitons, etc. I think there were 12 different knots we taught. I mean, uh, double sheep shank and sheet shank, etc. Knots, I mean, there, there's where they kind of got us. I mean, I'd never heard of some of those knots. And I mean, sometimes we use most of them, but basically, uh, basic knots, and I can't even remember them now. <laughs> but, Can you but, recall what the rope was made out of? I think it was nylon, I think. I never saw any manila ropes or hemp or anything like that. Later on, I would use uh, hemp for uh, stirrups, uh, actually. It didn't uh, bind up so much you can free it more quickly. You use the hemp for aid climbing? Uh, yeah, when, when necessary. Or prusiking. When Leighton and I did the diagonal, we, uh, we'd gain some as much as we could before we got blown off by the weather, by the lightning storms, hail, et cetera, et cetera. And then when that uh, forced us to repel, uh, we'd leave a Prusik line. And I'd use these uh, Italian hemp ropes, rather uh, stirrups that I made to, uh, to pain in the neck. I mean, it's just, again, that's something a baboon could do if you had enough. <laughs> but it's necessary unless you want to do the same thing over again every time you go up there. And that takes more time. I mean, Prusiking is faster, no question about that. But, uh, okay, let's return back to the 10th Mountain Division time. Um, 
were, was the military taking a look at what was being done in Europe? Did they follow the model of some of the climbers and famous mountaineers? I'm sure they did. I couldn't give you any names or anything like that, but uh, you know, that's where it started actually, climbing. People like Joe, Joe and Paul Stettner coming over here and doing work on the V's face. And that's where it started. Uh, Fritz Wiesner, uh, trying to think of some others. I don't think Gusta, Rebufa, I don't think he did any, any climbing here, but uh, that's basically how it, how it spread. European climbers came over here, and especially Germans. Uh, I don't recall any French, but uh, Fritz did some good work on the tower, Devil's Tower. It's, uh, you ought to, if you haven't done that, you ought to go up there. It's quite a, quite a formation. But, uh, where, were your, where were the rest of the guys in your company coming from in the 10th Mountain Division? You were coming from Kansas and Denver. <laughs> we had kids from... Uh, that, that unit was unique in that we estimated something like 94% of us had gone to college. And just, we had a choice of uh, joining up, uh, joining the military or getting drafted. And uh, most of us, uh, I was in the ROTC, but uh, I was getting a little tired of school, frankly. And uh, not to mention the expense. Uh, but uh, the, uh, there were kids, uh, we had quite a few kids from Denver. D.U. Uh, there were kids from Vermont, New Hampshire, upstate New York, etc. Uh, by and large, most of them had, uh, they, that is with the unit I, I was with, had, uh, had some experience with climbing. Uh, I'm uh, sure there were no, well, there weren't too many really serious rock climbers. They had done it. But uh, it, we all took to it like ducks to water. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, especially the skiing. In the course of time, I, when I left the Army, I, uh, to my own thinking, I had to make a decision. Am I going to get serious about skiing or serious about climbing? Because uh, I... To my thinking, when you specialize on something, when you focus all your energy and mental and physical on one, one thing, you're going to get better at it, rather. And besides then, uh, the skiing was not like it is now. I mean, it was a real athletic event. Uh, you lashed your skis, and, well, we didn't in the Army, but uh, <laughs> you we had long thongs. Your boot and ski would be one. And that's fine, it, it rendered better control, but if something went wrong, if you took a really bad fall, I mean, it, it was pretty grim. And I decided, uh, no, I, I mean, it was just assumed that if, if you were a serious skier in those days, you were gonna get a, boat, a broken leg at some time or another, as just in the books. You just yeah. braced yourself f philosophical to that. And I thought, well, that, hmm that would interfere with my climbing. So I, I, made, I made the decision when I left the Army, I, would, I wouldn't ski and I would focus totally on climbing. So, uh, and I would, to the extent possible, I would, uh, <clears throat> I would climb as much as possible, like every day. <laughs> when I lived in Boulder, I lived, lived up on West Grandview just below uh, Flagstaff, and I could get up. I could get up on Flagstaff in five minutes, be on rock. Well, ten, but uh, and I climbed seven days a week, all, all the time. And I guess that's one of the reasons. Eventually, when I started teaching high school, I um, my first teaching job was in Montana. Horrible rock. Uh, and on no time, I uh, had uh, what eventually I would discover was an illegal teaching load. 
uh, four subjects. It's not the number of courses, you, rather it's not the number of classes you teach, it's the number of individual courses, which of course take pre preparations. And I had four courses. I, I put in 10, 12 hour days. Then I got uh, drawn into coaching as well. I played high school and co college football. And when they found, I wasn't trained to coach, but when they found out that you had played high school and college football, then, uh, well, you, you can handle it. <laughs> but, uh, so backing up a little bit, uh, when you, what year about did you leave the military, leave the Mountain Division? 1955. 1955. Went and in in 53 and got out in 55. And you went 54. straight to Boulder? <sighs> no, I went straight to Bozeman, Montana, actually. Okay. When you returned to Boulder, did you find some climbing partners there? Yeah. In the former, mid 1950s? Uh, platoon buddies, actually. Some of us got out at about the same time. And uh, we sort of hung around together and started climbing. But, uh, the, uh, I was always fascinated and still am fascinated by, with Boulder. In fact, I came out here one winter when I was at Key State to, uh, I was a crazy kid. I, I ran down the president of the university, Mr. Stearns, gave him a call and he met me <laughs> on a Sunday morning, if you can imagine, and uh, gave me the information I, I needed. And, and I was very serious about making the, the, the switch, the transfer from Kansas State to Boulder. The whole thing just fascinated me. I'm just like a kid. In the... But it just didn't work out at that time. But uh, when I got out of the Army, I was on the Korean GI Bill. So uh, that helped a lot. So you entered school at the University of Colorado in Boulder? Uh, no, actually, when I first got out of the Army, I get this sort of swirled around. When I first got out of the Army, I was, I was married to a girl from Montana. And uh, she, was, uh, she was actually from uh, Bozeman. So she suggested that we go back to Bozeman. And uh, so I did. I, I started uh, school at uh, Montana State University. I, I had two years to, to go, to graduate. And uh, yeah, I spent two years, uh, started in the fall of uh, 1955 and graduated the spring of 1957. And uh, there would be a divorce at the tail end of in the spring of uh, 1957. Those things happen. But uh, to my thinking, they're not tragic. You, you, you move on. <laughs> And what did you study? Uh, I'll backtrack a little. When I was teaching, when I was uh, ski instructing and teaching climbing, I thought, hey, this is, I like this. First time I'd ever taught anything. And uh, like for example, uh, my last winter at Hale, there was a new outfit came along. There was Full bird colonel and uh, several LCs, lieutenant colonels, majors, his staff, the colonel's staff, sergeants, lieutenants, and what have you. And I was chosen to teach them to ski. And uh, kind of a soft touch, I met them at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and worked with them for about three hours and then let them go. <laughs> and I, I liked that. I mean, I, I enjoyed instructing whether it was climbing or, uh, or skiing. And I get, that's when the thought crossed my mind. I think, what would be, and I thought, I, I saw the movie uh, Blackboard Jungle, I think it was. And uh, it was in 1954, something like that. And I thought, that does it. I'm going to try teaching. I wouldn't want to teach grade school or junior high, but I'm going to 
teach high school. So I went back with that in mind. That was my, uh, I majored in history and uh, political science, etc. And I had a fantastic prof, Professor Oviat, Dr. Oviat. And uh, that's when uh, it, it really snared me. I mean, I was uh, interested, yes, but, but I, I didn't have a, this burning zeal to shape young minds. I just wanted to teach. And uh, anyway, uh, but this, this is deviating, digressing somewhat, but the guy never used notes. He never used notes. He knew, he knew the subject, his subject so well that, uh, and he always, he stood and he ranged back and forth with his hands behind his back. And uh, he talked and he told it as a story. I mean, the story behind the facts. Everybody got the facts, and that's why history is boring if it's nothing but facts, names, and places. But if you tell, explain why Jackson, how Jackson won the battle at New Orleans in 1813, uh, how to a, to a considerable detail, as in a story fashion, the people involved and what they did and why, then history becomes, I mean, it's a story in which it should be anyway, something besides names, dates, and facts. And that, the guy inspired me to a point where I thought, that's how I'm going to teach. And uh, a lot of work involved, <laughs> but uh, you have to research everything every morning. But uh, anyway, so anyway, I got, uh, that's how I started teaching. <clears throat> After the... Uh, situation in, uh, in Bozeman, I uh, moved to Boulder, actually, remarried, and uh, started doing a lot more climbing. I didn't, didn't have time in, in Montana to climb then, but uh, I uh, took off. Uh, I thought, well, I'll beef up my credentials a little. I, I wasn't in the mood to start teaching right as soon as I had graduated. In fact, I'd been approached by an organization and they wanted a, someone to run their climbing school and uh, to guide, what have you. I mean, usually you look for a, start looking for a job when you graduate. I didn't. They came and got, they said, hey, will you, we're a, a new company, a startup a corporation, a lodge, et cetera, chalet, uh, will you join us. So I, okay. <laughs> and uh, it was a good experience for a time. What was the name of that company? Actually, at the time, it was called Peaceful Valley Lodge. It's still there, I think. There are several chalets now. We were, at the time, they were building the first chalet. The old building was there, but they were building new buildings. and. They, uh, it was a neat area. It, uh, it was a good experience, but uh, uh, partnerships, I, I don't know, you get too many in them and uh, some of the partners start fighting and what have you, and their wives start fighting and what have you, and it, uh, that's a long story. Well, not really. But, uh, but after a couple of years there, I decided, no, I, I need to go. I'm going back to what I was supposed to do in the first place. I'm going to and I got a job teaching at uh, Corvallis, Montana. It's in the Bitterroot, Bitterroot Valley, south of uh, Missoula. Beautiful area, stunning, actually. When you returned to Montana, did you do more climbing there? Some. I did some up Highlight Canyon. Uh, I, uh, that's south of Bozeman, actually. Some decent granite, actually. But uh, my time spent in Montana was pretty well, pretty well consumed uh, making a living, uh, <laughs> either going to school or teaching. And, uh, but it, uh, I still love that state. I, I've toyed with the idea of maybe moving back there.
One year, at, I taught one year at uh, Corvallis in the Bitterroot. And I loved it. And I've, I, I still look back on it as maybe a mistake uh, leaving it because uh, my superintendent, and school board members, et cetera, told me, Ray, and this was uh, as the spring approached my first year there, you can teach here the rest of your life if you want. We'd like that. So. And, but something happened um, in, oh, I guess it was about March or so, March or April. Um, backtracking a bit when I was upgrade, beefing up my credentials in Boulder after I left Peaceful Valley. Uh, Nan and I, my wife at the time, uh, we'd drive to Estes Park. And uh, didn't have enough money to go to a restaurant, but we we'd uh, get a, bring a thermos of uh, a thermos of coffee and a couple of sandwiches, and we'd drive out to uh, I think they call it Tiny Town or something like that, west of town, and we'd park and look up at Lockville, sip coffee, black coffee, and I said, one time one time I said, we're, someday we're going to live here, we're going to live here. That was my goal then. And uh, that March, d despite the situation in uh, that what I'd, I, li I liked the area, I liked the people, I loved them, and, but uh, I still had this little thing in my, in my head about Estes Park. So just for kicks, I thought, well, I'll send a cover letter to, uh, to uh, the superintendent at Estes Park High School. And uh, I won't have a chance because that's a sought after destination. I mean, who knows how many hundreds of applications they have. Uh, but what, what's, I mean, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, so I sent it and uh, about a week later, I got a phone call. And uh, it was the superintendent of Estes Park. He says, Ray, I'm Mr. Northcutt, I'm very interested in your your uh, application. Uh, is there some way we can talk? I said, well, not right now. I said, uh, how would it be if uh, as soon as I finish the uh, spring, spring semester here, I come down and uh, we, we have a little chat? And that's basically the way it worked. He says, yes, I, I want to see you. And uh, so I got sort of a break in the in the spring there, and <clears throat> I drove all the way in a pickup truck to Boulder, <clears throat> rather to Estes Park, Colorado, and I met uh, Walt Edwards, the superintendent here at the time, uh, Sunday morning, and we talked for uh, I don't know, a couple of hours, I guess it was, and uh, he says, "Well, Ray." Uh, he said, you've got a dynamite recommendation here from your superintendent. He said, this is one of the best I've ever seen. So I said, well, thank you. <laughs> he said, I need to leave. I'll go down the hall and talk with the principal. And uh, I had spoken with him for a while also and uh, then went back to Walt. And uh, they, they chatted a bit for about 10 minutes, came back, and they said, well, job's yours, Ray, if you want it. And one of the saddest things I've ever done was to drive out of the Bitterroot Valley and leave that place. I, I still have friends there, and most of them, they, most of them are gone too now. But some of the students are still still around. But uh, as you look, you look back on something like that, and uh, I don't know, you, you make the best decision you can at the time that you have the opportunity to make it. And sometimes you don't even have the opportunity. Sometimes you don't have any choice of, of matters. But I had a choice there. And I, so I moved down here and uh, starved to death teaching at Estes Park High School. <laughs> teaching. You didn't go into teaching. I mean, uh, it was a privilege, and still is, of course, a privilege to uh, teach at, uh, at this school system. And I think it is. But uh, of course, the teaching salaries are 
infinitely better than they were then. But, uh, but after fi frankly, after five years, of, uh, I got tired of it. Uh, and uh, it's, I went to another direction from that. But ironically, some of my best friends now are former, former students. And that, to me, that's probably the best thing I got out of teaching. Was a <laughs> well, let's see. What else? It sounds like it was our gain that you came to Estes Park. Uh, you taught here and you continued to pioneer much of the first ascents in the area, some of which are considered classics today. Well, I don't climb any longer, but uh, I, uh, I came back here thinking that I could, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to move back to Estes, rather to Estes, in addition to just living there. I mean, look at the rock. I mean, I had visions or delusions, rather, uh, of uh, having time to climb. But I basically ended up with the same situation I had. Uh, early on, I had four different courses. And with the system I used, I mean, I got up at 4 o'clock every morning to research each, each lecture. Because I, would, I wasn't going to just, like some teachers I've had, they write something on a board and um, various things, and I look them up. So you, you end up looking up, think, looking whatever's on, on the board, you end up looking it up yourself. But Oviat, he told a story, and I resolved to do it that way, without notes. I mean, he never, his head wasn't bobbing up and down all the time, but uh, I uh, got up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, researched the, the, that, the subject for that course, I had to read it first, I'd write it down, and uh, then I'd walk into my room at six o'clock in the morning, and I'd review it somewhat, and I'd put it away, close the, close the drawer. And from that point forth, I'd, uh, I'd walk back and forth, uh, across the room, look out the window once in a while, but I was telling that story. And uh, a lot of work, a lot of time. And, uh, note, and eventually, um, for example, the, uh, f my first year here, the uh, football coach uh, was removed. And the superintendent called me in. He said, Ray, and going through the records, Ray, I, I find that you played high school and college football. Yes, sir, but I wasn't trained to coach. Don't worry about it. So anyway, I ended up coaching the last four years, and I had a ball. I loved it. I mean, I didn't think I would, but... Uh, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was a good experience. But uh, again, back to finance, I mean, uh, we weren't making it. Uh, but I found something in which I could. <laughs> so it would end up taking, uh, taking us overseas, but uh, I looked forward to that also. Um. Would you please share any recollections you have of the 1956 ascent of the North, North Cut Carter route on Hallett's Peak? Today, um, part of the first two pitches are yeah, completely different than how you experienced them. A rock fall in 1999 has, has changed the mountain significantly, but at the time that you went or completed the ascent with Carter, um, you had attempted twice prior, but bad weather got in the way. Can you remember the day that you completed it? Well, first off, first time we hit the wall was in 1954, I believe. Harvey said, "Hey, Ray, I got to climb. You got to. We got to." really check out. I knew nothing about it. I'd never been to Rocky Mountain National Park, but we finagled a three-day weekend pass. And uh, I had a beat-up old Chevy, and we dry, drove o over here and uh, packed in, and he said, well, that's it. And uh, it, it's an impressive wall, actually. 
So we, uh, we started, and it really wasn't, the climbing wasn't, I was surprised it wasn't that difficult. But they go up, I think, first lead is vertical, and second lead, I think, is vertical. And then you make a traverse to the left, and you, as it's turned out, I have no idea how many routes there are in, uh, on the north face of Hallett's, rather the third buttress, I mean. But uh, we made progress. We moved up probably, I don't know, three leads or so, and because uh, we started late, and uh, <clears throat> but the weather came in, and really, you don't climb in something like that. I mean, it turns the wall to a series of waterfalls. As quickly as you can, you repel off, and uh, we didn't leave any Prusik lines on Hallett, so for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> that was my early. Hallett's was, to, to my thinking, it was... Uh, my first experience with a big wall, <laughs> with a, because what we'd done in the Army, we didn't have that, none of, none of the things we did had that many pitches, that many leads. And uh, it made quite an impression on me, actually. It, uh, as time would progress, uh, and we'd go back, let's see, that was the summer, of, I believe, in the yeah, summer of 54, and I did, I'd, Harvey and I had made the agreement that we'd hit it later on when we got out of the Army. And I guess it was, uh, uh, we had tried again, I think, in uh, 50, 55 or so, and we got blasted off again. And uh, in 56, we decided to try again. And uh, we made it. We never had... Uh, as I recall, we never got hit once that, that, that day. We got close enough to the top that, uh, and it, it left quite an impression upon me. Uh, but later on, that would, uh, I look back, it would turn out to be the, of the more serious climbs I did, it was the easiest thing I've done. In fact, Leighton and I would get, as part of our training for the diagonal in the spring of uh, 59, we'd go up there and do it in an hour, leapfrogging. And, but everybody I've, with whom I've spoken, they've done a different route on it. So the second time we did it, it uh, that is when Leighton and I did it, I, it was, I, to my thinking, it was probably somewhat to the left of what Harvey and I did. But everybody I've, with, whom I've, with whom I've spoken, of, they've done a different, a different route on it. So the thing has to be loaded with routes. I mean, you can take your choice, probably. So I look back on it now as a, have you ever met um, Pat Ament? He's written a book, I think it's called uh, Wizards of Rock. And he asked me to contribute to it. And I wrote, I'll give you a copy of it if you want. Uh, I, he asked me to comment on the North Face of Hallett's, uh, the Diagonal, and the Bastille. And uh, I wrote separate articles on that, not articles, but... Uh, a statement, I guess you could say, in my assessment of each. But uh, yeah, I look back on Hallett's now as a, a fun climb, and uh, what I thought was pretty good rock. <laughs> I guess it's not as solid as we thought, but something like the lower eighth or fourth of the wall just sloughed off. I, I'm, I've been told anyway, because a, a new route there, a new, a new pitch anyway. <laughs> That climb is pretty historical because it opened the door to the possibilities of big wall climbing in Rocky Mountain National Park. That's what I've heard, <laughs> yeah. And you continued to set your sights pretty high. You went on to the diamond of Long's Peak and- you Diagonal. Went, and tell me about the diagonal, please. Well, we got Dale, Dale Johnson, I felt, I, I don't know if he's still around or not. But Dale and I, Dale contacted, contacted me when I was still in Montana and said he'd like to team up with me and, and hit something called the diamond. Well, I knew about the diamond. But um, <clears throat> so we made the decision to do the diamond. 
And, uh, and for, regrettably, uh, Dale went to the superintendent of Rocky Mountain National Park, James V. Lloyd, and, and said, uh, we'd like to do this. And, and why? I don't know. Because of my idea, let's just do it. And if they want to throw, throw us in the slammer afterwards, okay, that, those things happen. But uh, anyway, Dale went to him. He said, now, wait a minute. You want to do that? And he said, absolutely not. He said, if you touch that, I'll throw bo both of you in jail. So Dale didn't want to go to jail. And really, I didn't want to either. So I thought, well, times in the course, times will change. I mean, someday it'll, I predicted it's going to open up. So my thinking was, uh, so Dale and I went our separate ways. And uh, I got, I'd been looking at that. Uh, I chose to call it the diagonal because it, there's a main rack, uh, a main uh, track going upward and diagonally to the left all the way up to Broadway. It's not as prominent as the, as the diamond, but uh, very smooth looking, et cetera, and with a series of uh, overhangs about a third of the way up, et cetera, et cetera. So, but uh, I was buddies with uh, uh, Willie Colony and John Clark. They were the Rangers on Long's Peak. And the Ranger Station was a, was a shack, and uh, we were good buddies. Uh, we usually drink a couple of beers before heading up the trail, et cetera, to Chasm Lake. And, uh, but uh, Willie, John, and I, and whoever my partner, I went through partners like whoever my partner was at the time, uh, we'd, uh, I said, look, I, uh, I'm going to, to hit that thing, and I'm not going to ask anybody. Uh, I'm telling you, but uh, I, I'm assuming uh, we'll just keep it between the four of us. Okay? And I said, absolutely. We'll watch you. We'll monitor it. And we'll, we'll keep track of you. And Because uh, <clears throat> as I understand it, the main reason they turned us, that uh, Lloyd had, turned us down for the, uh, the diamond was, okay, if somebody got in trouble, what are we going to do? Let them hang there for how many years? I mean, they hadn't, really didn't have the recovery or the rescue or the recovery means to uh, do anything for anybody. They couldn't get you down. You were on your own. There's a guy named Willie, uh, Tony Kurtz, I think. He hung on the Iger for I forget how many years because nobody could get him down. <laughs> He's just dangling there and swinging back and forth in the wind. And the, the, I guess, I suppose that would have been bad publicity for the Park Service if they couldn't rescue you. So, anyway. Um, so, uh, we had this little plot going on between the two <laughs> Park Service Rangers and whoever I was climbing with at the time. Uh, First time I hit the diagonal, we got up a ways, and sure enough, uh, we got hit by a whale of a storm. And my partner at the time, I, he went back to Boulder telling people, hey, that guy's crazy. <laughs> and that thing is something else. And so I, I was having difficulty finding, at the time, finding someone to... But uh, lo and behold, uh, did you ever meet Baker? No, you couldn't have. Baker Armstrong, have you heard of him? He was in the climbing school that uh, I started when I was at K-State, and one of my instructors. But uh, one, uh, one evening uh, while I was at, um, in Boulder, after the first attempt when we got bomb bombed off the diagonal, my phone rang and it was Baker. He says, Ray, I have a fellow here who wants to meet you. And I'd like, I'd like for you to meet him because I think he's what you're looking for. Happened. I said, well, bring him up. So about 30 minutes later, this six foot whatever kid uh, came up through the, the uh, stairwell with Baker. He had to duck every, through, every door he went through, but uh, it was late and core. Cool. And we basically, to make a long story short, we, we chatted. We, 
began to see one another once in a while and uh, did a little climbing and uh, not a lot. I was going to school at the time and it was just easier for me to, uh, in those years, just uh, at a certain time of the afternoon, I'd hop in my, my truck and uh, just head up to Flagstaff. And, uh, but we, when, when the spring came of 59, we, we hit it every weekend, and I hit it every day in between, actually on Flagstaff. But um, <clears throat> so Leighton and I got along. Uh, we usually leapfrogged. But uh, I, I think I made that statement. I, my last sentence and what I, when I for that book was uh, following uh, the experiences with uh, with Hallett's. Uh, I sought and hit uh, more difficult climbs actually and apparently improved as a climber. <laughs> but I do, I look back on, on Hallett's as a, a fun climb and uh, a good experience, good memories, actually. I think that was incredibly brave. <laughs> I, Hallett, is, it's a confusing peak. There's so many lines on it, yeah. like you were saying, so. I had in yeah. mind uh, Very courageous. doing the middle buttress. But uh, at the time, I couldn't find anybody who could f to do it. <laughs> okay, so you aim for and the I third. I hadn't started solo climbing at that day. In the, in the course of time, um, when I quit, I, uh, when I quit climbing, when I finally just, well, I was going overseas. And I was heading for Vietnam, and I didn't anticipate any opportunities to climb over there. <laughs> but <laughs> I uh, decided to, uh, I decided that someday I'd get back to it. And when I'd quit, are we on now? Yeah. Oh, wasn't aware. <laughs> when I'd quit climbing, uh, I tried to, every now and then I'd slip, when I was teaching Odestus, I'd try to slip out on a weekend. And if I had the chance, if I wasn't out of town with coaching or, um, I just finally got so frustrating that, uh, I'd been so thoroughly accustomed to climbing every day that uh, I didn't, I'd lost, I felt like I'd lost an edge, like I'd lost, uh, I wasn't where I was at one time, and I wasn't comfortable with that. So I figured, well, I'll take my ball and bat and, and go someplace else. I'll, uh, I'll quit for the time being, I'll hang him up. But I never really intended to quit permanently. And, uh, but before I had quit, I'd been working on a solo rig. I mean, that, that really, the more I got into that, the more I, I mean, that, that's really something. When you get, take off on something like that alone and uh, no arguments as to which way you're going or, or, uh, or uh, hey, we better nail this or, or whatever. Um, but, uh, it was a work in progress, shall we say, when I, when I left. Uh, I got up on, uh, on one of Leighton's uh, climbs in uh, El Dorado. I think it's called Red Garden, Red Guard, Red Garden Wall or something like that. And uh, I went up, I got halfway up with, along with my solo rig, and I got a halfway across to traverse and the thing jammed. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't free it. I mean, it just, I was, uh, there was. So I took my hammer, a Wall Street block hammer, and I put the rope on the, on the wall like that, bam, 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 and cut the rope, and I finished with nothing. And uh, it, but it was, this thing had worked, and I think if I'd followed up on it, it I'd, I could have worked the bugs out of it. But now, I mean, when I got back from, uh, when I uh, stopped my overseas work, I, uh, in fact, it was Bernard, Bernard uh, uh, Gillette. Gillette. He, uh, he says, Ray, I'll take you up El Dorado this afternoon. And uh, we were having lunch at the 
Ruby Tuesdays or someplace like that in Boulder. And uh, he said, oh, I'll show you something. And he had a Swiss rig, solo rig. I guess the Germans and the Swiss were, had really perfected several rigs. And he says, I'll show you something. So we went, he drove us out to uh, El Dorado. And just down the way from uh, the Bastille, my route there, and uh, he just took off alone. And it, the thing just click, click, push, pull. I mean, just uh, it was mind boggling. I mean, it, it, it works. And if I ever do, uh, maybe when I, if I, my 90th birthday, I'll come roaring out of retirement, and <laughs> that's what I'll do. It'll be solo climbing. It's just less complicated. Harvey and I used to get in some of the craziest arguments over, over, over various things. <laughs> I mean, we never, never got to a fisticuffs or anything like that, but uh, Harvey and I argued a bit, and so did George and I. <laughs> but, <laughs> With but, George uh, Lamb. Yeah. But, uh, that's the way I'd go. I'd go solo. It's, it's a rail. There's climbing there. And what kind of partner was Leighton Core? Very good, obviously. As I told the people in Boulder last June, I said, somebody asked me, he said, Ray, what kind of, uh, what, was, what was it like to climb with Leighton? And I thought about it a few seconds. I said, well, he was without question the most tenacious climber I've ever dealt with. He was also, I might add, the most voracious, the most voracious climber I've ever dealt with. I honestly believe that had I, had I called him at 4 o'clock in the morning the day after we finished the diagonal and said something to the effect of, hey, Leighton, had a dream last night. Uh, you and I took off for Devil's Tower this morning and we bagged six first descents. You game? He would have said, hell yes, pick you up in 20 minutes. I mean, he... He never tired of climbing. I mean, he just, he was, and uh, as I told him also, I said, uh, there was an old, there's an old saying that uh, years ago, uh, there are old climbers and bold climbers, but there are no old bold climbers. And, uh, but uh, as I put it, Leighton, boy, you sure blew the hell out of that myth. But, uh, that's, I quit on that. <laughs> he was uh, the best I'd ever dealt with. I mean, uh, he, uh, we had our differences of opinions once in a while. He was more, we could get into uh, a discussion. Uh, my th to my thinking, the, ideally you attempt to do it free, that is, without direct aid. And, uh, but once, I mean, uh, because I know, I knew of people, that's all, I mean, they just, to my thinking, they went into aid, direct aid, too quickly and, and on areas that really didn't justify it. But, uh, and uh, they become like this fellow I described a while ago with the, the drill. Good grief, that guy just, this is, I mean, that's, that's not climbing. I think, uh, to my thinking, uh, direct aid takes away from climbing, if it can be done free, that is, without direct aid. Where was this? And once in a while, we'd, uh, maybe I'd take a little bit too much time trying to find a way to do it free. And Leighton would get a little impatient. Well, come on, let's nail this thing. <laughs> but uh, he was... Um, he, uh, I don't know. It was a shame he had to uh, end that way. It was a, not a pleasant way to, to go. But, uh, to be that, that vigorous, that, in that kind of physical condition, and then uh, be affected by that, I don't know that much about it, uh, but uh, he had several illnesses, illnesses, I guess. But uh, I saw him um, 
oh, about four years ago, and I was invited to a party in Boulder. And uh, he, uh, we had a good time. Went off to a corner of the, one of the rooms and chatted a bit. We'd both been in the Philippines for a spell. And he'd, when he'd, he'd quit climbing for a while and he got caught up into sailing, I believe, and fishing. And uh, I told him that I'd lived there for a spell. And that uh, we both liked it. But, uh, but after they stole my car, I decided you could not, there's no way a person could ever have keep anything nice in his house. It would just, eventually it would happen. It would just disappear. <laughs> but that, that's a... Uh... He was, uh, it was a good experience climbing with Leighton. And uh, he was very angry with me on one occasion when uh, I couldn't go to Europe with him. We had planned to do so. We wanted to hit the ma three main problems, as they were called. There were three north walls. I think Pete's Badil was one of them. I forget the others. Herman Beale was my idol. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was an Austrian climber, and he was pretty heavy into solo stuff also. But, yeah, I finished my first year of teaching, and I was so broke I couldn't have gone. I was lucky to make it back to Colorado. But, uh, and he was uh, not terribly happy with me because we couldn't follow through with what we'd planned to do. But uh, we were both, basically, truth be known, we were both essentially, we didn't have the money to do it. Europe's expensive, terribly expensive. Uh, year, years later, I would uh, get caught up in a direction in which uh, I was doing some consulting, export consulting, and I would uh, go back and forth to Europe frequently. And if they think life's expensive here, uh, it's, it's pretty grim over there. <laughs> Ray, is it true that Leighton tricked you into starting the North Cut start on the Piz, uh, excuse me, on the Bastille crack in El Leighton. Dorado? No? Uh, it was one afternoon, uh, and there's quite a, I understand, as explained to me, there's been quite a controversy. Uh, in this regard, uh, it amazes me. Uh, once in a while, I'll pick up a book and somebody's quoting me, quoting me, somebody I've never met in my life, and he's quoting me, blah, 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 and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, for example, the, well, digressing a bit, uh, I've read uh, one guy who <coughs> explained that. Uh, Carter and I took so long to do the, make the ascent. Well, good grief, when you get blasted off, I mean, I'm not going to climb in the rain. Ideally, you pick and choose a little better than that. But um, there are all kinds of stories about that one, I guess, from what I've heard. But what happened, uh, and I was asked this, and I wasn't expecting the question. At the, that was the first question. I'd, uh, <laughs> Ron Foreman, he was a professional photographer and a, stu and a student at the uh, University of Colorado at the time. Um, I was writing an article for Empire Magazine, which was a magazine of the Denver Post, and I needed photographs. So we were, uh, we'd done a little climbing up on Flagstaff that afternoon, and we'd finished the shots we were going to take then. Uh, he says, Ray, um, I know of a climb I think you'd really like. Leighton and I did it yesterday afternoon. I said, well, what is it? And he says, oh, well, if, you, if you're game, well, we can go over there. I said, is it free? Is it direct aid or free? He said, it's free. No direct aid involved. And uh, I said, well, let's, let's go do it. So I, I had a new pickup, Ford pickup truck at that time. We hopped in the truck. And, and drove to El Dorado Springs, and and, and uh, he says, "Pull off here." So okay, 
I said, well, where is it? He said, there. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, okay. You, t you feed the rope out here, and uh, it's mostly a lie back. And uh, I, uh, I did it. It was, I must, I got halfway out and I thought, holy smoke. It was, uh, it was a challenge. And uh, I got up to the top and I brought Ron up and uh, we stood there a bit and he says, Ray, I have a, have a confession to make. And I said, what's that? Leighton and I used direct aid all the way up this thing. <laughs> and that, that's what happened. Now there's some, uh, I understand there's, uh, oh, I've read some crazy things uh, that I, I said, well, if Leighton, Leighton can do it, I can do it, blah, blah. <clears throat> but Foreman was the guy who was on the first descent, but they nailed it all away, according to uh, and I've heard this from other. So uh, I'm um, I've read articles about it. That is, uh, people quoting me, and I never, never. Uh, that's the way it was. As I told them there, I said, I turned to the crowd and I said, that's the way it was, and. Uh, I don't know. I guess it's, uh, I'm told that uh, some people uh, feel I use direct aid at certain, certain portions of it. I didn't take anything with me for direct aid. So I'm, I wish, I, every now and then, I wish I could run, run, find Ron Foreman. <laughs> but I don't, I don't even, even know if he's alive yet. Well, in the end, didn't you feel a great feeling of accomplishment? That was the very first 510D in That's the country. That's what I'm told. But you know something? And here's what a lot of people, and I, I wrote my coverage, uh, my statement on, on it, uh, a short story <laughs> for uh, that book, Wizards of Rock. I'll bring it out to you. It'd be a good uh, something for your collection here. And while I'm on that, I think uh, Pat Ament is a good writer. He's a very, very good writer. This is a good book. But anyway, um, my, <clears throat> my portion of that book, I explained the way it happened, as I've explained here. But uh, I looked at that time when I finished, went back to my, had a basement apartment on West uh, Grandview. And uh, Nan said, well, what, where have you been? I, I said, well, I had a workout at uh, El Dorado. But I guess my explanation is I looked at it at the time and I did through the years as an afternoon's workout. I, I didn't give it a name. I didn't register it any place. It was just a, a hell of a lie back. I mean, uh, I mean, I, that, that night after we did after I did it, I went downtown. There was a place um, I usually drank a couple of glasses of wine. A few climbers got together on Pearl Street. I, and I can see it now, but I don't know the, the name of it. But uh, I told George Lamb and a few others, I said, hey, there's a whale of a work out there. And I described it, how to, how to get to it. Uh, you'll like it. It's, it's something else. <laughs> But um, I looked at it as, and, and that's the way I put it, as an afternoon's workout. I never gave it, gave it a name. I never registered it with anybody. And I just basically tuned it. You never forget something like that. I just basic, I didn't dwell on it. In the better part of 20 years, an Englishman by the name of Bob Godfrey, he was writing a book, uh, called me from Boulder, and I was leaving Ernestus Park at the time. That's when I was going back and forth overseas quite a bit. And he wanted, he was writing a book called Climb, I think, or something like that. And he wanted my, some input from me. And um, 
That was the first. It was almost 20 years after I did the crazy thing. The better part of 20 years, actually, as I recall. And, you know, you, you don't remember everything about it, even the... So, as I, as I explained, I hadn't even th thought of it much. You never completely forget something like that, but you don't dwell on it. And I, it was never even discussed. And this one, he asked me, he suddenly held up some black and white photos. Do you remember this? And yeah, it, yeah I saw a guy spread eagle there. And uh, yeah, I instantly knew what it was. I said, yeah, I, uh, what, is, what do you call it? And they call it the North Cuts Direct on the Bastille, I think he said. And he said it's the first... It's written up as the first 510, the limit of possibility, I guess. I don't know anything about the grading system. But it's the first 510 done in the country. Now that, that's, as I recall, him, what he said. And, but then they start asking questions. Well, how did you do such and such or so and so? Well, good grief. Uh, after almost 20 years, I mean, no, I couldn't ex explain exactly how I did this or did that. In fact, I mean, if you were to ask me how I did a certain traverse on uh, Red Guard Wall, Red Garden Wall or Red Guard Wall in, in, in uh, El Dorado, where I, where I soloed it, I couldn't begin to, and with, not with a gun in my back, could I describe how I technically climbed it, whether I got a press here and a, and a lay there or whatever. Uh, no, not after, especially after almost 20 years. So I, I don't know. But uh, it's, climb, I think climbers are different now. They're, they're, they're more, uh, if I went back to climbing, I'd have to go find somebody and make believe I'd never climbed in my life because I don't know what they're talking about. The equipment, etc. You mentioned pitons and they laugh. And that stuff we use, and I mean, on the diagonal, for example, I'd try, I had a belt and I had six categories of pitons, uh, three on each side, uh, verticals up front, uh, horizontals, angles, etc. I had a selection of, I had, and I, it weighed a lot because I had to take a variety, a hellacious variety with me in, in number to, because frequently nothing worked. I mean, I'd uh, try one and bend like a gum wrapper. So I pitched that and I'd try another. And, and uh, finally, was, there were times when, okay, it would hold the carabiner and guide the rope. And, <laughs> uh, but now they don't do that. Uh, our, our pitons were not, uh, they, they were less than what you had in mind. But, uh, the Californians were a breakthrough. I mean, the, the ropes, the realization of the ultimate reality piton, I mean, they were such hard, uh, the, the ten, tensile, uh, the metal they used was, it was just mind boggling. They, they, and they worked. And if they, they wouldn't bend, I mean, they'd, Chip out the rock, if, if anything. I mean, the, the rock wasn't as strong as a piton frequently. frequently. <laughs> yeah, the, the equipment now is, I, like I said, I don't, I don't even know what they're talking about. They use friends and cams, and that's probably antiquated also. But, uh, as I said, if I, if I do uh, go back to climbing, I... Uh, my wife has made me promise I would never win, <laughs> but uh, I said, look, if you cash in your chips first, uh, I'll, uh, that's when I, I'll probably start. But, uh, <laughs> uh, now that I, I'm, I've been thinking of uh, talking with somebody, and so maybe hiring them as a consultant to, uh, to explain to me the, 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 the equipment. I'm uh, thinking of going back to writing, not writing not, I wouldn't write about anything I've done or anything, but the sport. That, uh, that uh, article I wrote for Empire Magazine um, was a project for a creative writing class, actually. And uh, 
Each photo demonstrated a, uh, a given portion or area of climbing, lie back or horizontal overhang or, or balanced climbing, delicate climbing, et cetera. Anything else you want to know about that thing? <laughs> I ha thank you for clearing up the record, and I'm glad that the, the record is set straight and it's deserving of your name. I have one more question for you. Yeah. What do you want people to know about the history of climbing in Estes Park? <clears throat> It's the first time that's ever been asked to me, of me anyway. I would like people such as Paul, Paul, um, ah, good grief, slip in the cog here. The two German brothers who did this, Stettner, yeah, Paul and Joe Stettner, uh, to get the the full honor that they they deserved. I mean, the the uh, I think they climbed with a Manila rope, <laughs> from what I've heard, but uh, they drove out of here from Chicago on a on two motor Indian motorcycles. They slept on the edge of the road. In those years, you could sleep on the edge of a road without being waylaid, whacked in the, in the middle of the night. I'd like people like people. I'd like those people to be remembered and respected for what they did at the time. Actually, and gradually, as the decades went by, uh, people like Harvey Carter, uh, Dal Jackson, George Lamb. And Leighton, of course. I look back on the 50s. Uh, it, it's, uh, there was such. Uh, I remember, for example, another weekend pass, which Harvey and I got out of Camp Hale that summer. I think it was summer of 54. And we, he says, hey, Ray, um, I know about this rock formation. It's south southeast of, As of Aspen. You know, we need to go up Lincoln Gulch to get to it. And it's, uh, I think they call it the I'll catch it in a minute. But Anyway, we, we drove over to Independence Pass. At the time I had a beat up Chevy and we started up this, uh, this road called Lincoln Gulch. Now, I think it's a campsite now, but in the summer of 54, we came up over this horizon. I remember this entire valley, this area of nothing but solid, a sea of columbines. And there was a slight breeze, and I, and I just, we just stood there and we watched that. We were alone, nobody else. There wasn't any trail or, and it wasn't a good road, but it was, uh, we, uh, I'll never forget that, that, that sea of columbine. <laughs> and finally, I thought, well, we better push on. And uh, we did several towers up there. The elk range, that's it, the elk range. They're south of Aspen, I believe. But um, we did several firsts up there, camped for a day or so. Good rock, solid rock. And they weren't 800. Well, they probably, they were, there were several things. I'm sure they were 800 foot, but uh, nothing like, uh, they were just fun. And the, the beautiful, beautiful scenery from every direction. I mean, you could look to uh, the west, to the West Elks. You could look to the south, to the Collegiate Range. You could look to the north, rather, the, yeah, the northeast, to the, to the uh, Sawatch. And from every direction, I mean, you had a 360 degree range there of just solid, I mean, beautiful Colorado, 14ers in every direction. 
the Plata to the east. And, and uh, that's where climbing started with experiences like that. And uh, I enjoyed, uh, before I got into the technical aspect of it and into the command, into the mountain training command with the 10th, uh, I enjoyed uh, walking up Elbert, uh, Evans, Longs. <laughs> this idea which uh, Steve Grossman has Forget the name he applied to it, but he's digging up these oh, these these antiquities of uh, these experiences of us old codgers, and uh, and uh, recording them actually. And he uh, most of us um, at that that group I forget the name of it. They applied to it. Most of us, uh, Dave Rarick. Camps is gone. Harvey's gone. Uh, a lot of people that were there just out of curiosity to listen to a few of us. And uh, yeah, most I think most of the people there were out of uh, just out of curiosity about ancient climbing, <laughs> pitons carabiners, etc. This was at the Leighton Corps Memorial at yeah. Neptunes in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. You've had an opportunity to climb all over the state of Colorado, in Wyoming. What, in your mind, makes rock climbing exceptional in Estes Park? The sheer abundance and variety. I mean, you can find it's nothing uh, that is Lumpy Ridge, for example, in terms of variety, holy smoke. You can find just about anything you, you want on Twin Owls. You don't have to climb just the chimney. Uh, there's a lot of, Leighton and I went up uh, one time, uh, the West End, I forget what they call it now. I saw a picture of it back in there. Dihedral, I think they call it. The main f formation to the west end of uh, Lumpy Ridge. Sundance? Yeah, I guess that's it. Sundance but, uh, Petrus. A lot of times I've done a lot of things uh, in which I just did them. I didn't give them a name, like the best deal. Uh, Dale Jackson called me one time. Uh, I was up in Bozeman. Spring break, he says, Ray, and there's a thing on, uh, there's a route on Devil's Tower. It's called a solar route, but it's all direct aid. The first descent did it strictly by nailing, nailing their way up. And he says, uh, what would, would you be interested in doing a, uh, a free climb of it? I said, well, yeah. Well, I'll meet you down there, okay? And uh, we did it. I led the whole thing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, uh, but now I'm wondering, uh, w what's its status now? <laughs> because I never recorded, I never went to the superintendent, I never signed a register or anything. But uh, I understand there's a fellow by the name of Angus McGee, who's written, written a, a guidebook on Devil's Tower. I'm going to try to run that down and see what he, what he has. But, uh, the only two climbs I've done in Devil's, I've done the Wiesner Crack twice and the Solar Route once. Uh, the sheer variety of rock here, whether it's the Craigs or Lumpy Ridge or the park. Good grief. Uh, Leighton got excited about something called Chief's Head. And uh, I, get, uh, I look back on it, and, and I'm still, I'm, I'm very, very, all I need to do is look up at the diamond, and, I, and I'm a bit, I'm disappointed. I'm, I, uh, that's one of my big disappoint, disappointments that I didn't get to do 
the diamond. The sheer variety and abundance of really great granite in this area. Just some areas have uh, climbed in the area I was uh, climbing in western Montana. I think it was called the Sapphire Range. Just nothing even close to the quality of rock which we have here. Some of those ranges are old formations. And <coughs> But uh, this should be a, a rock climber's heaven to live in Estes Park. And uh, when you want to get, get more serious about something, you can head for the, head for the, the face. Uh, I'm sure there's still faces out there that uh, probably very few uh, firsts around, but... Uh, there's plenty to do. But, uh, you can always, usually find a new route on just about anything. I'm sure you could find a new route on several new routes on on Twin Owls. <laughs> but, uh, is that it? <laughs> um, you had. You did the first ascent of the diagonal on the east face. Uh, you expressed some disappointment about the diamond. Well, as, I, as you know, the diamond was illegal. At, when, at the time we did the diagonal, in fact, that was one of the reasons I did it, <clears throat> um, the diamond was, diamond was illegal. Ironically, I guess it was a year or so later, they would, uh, because of the, the uh, first descent of the diagonal, they did open up the diamond. Well, by that time I was someplace else and I hadn't climbed in a year. And uh, I had, to, had a job that summer. I was almost broke. And I had to quit being a climbing bum and, uh, and uh, get serious about other things. So I figured, well, eventually I'll get around to it. And, uh, but, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> but uh, five years of teaching didn't uh, lend itself to that. And uh, U.S. Foreign Service uh, overseas didn't lend itself to it. But, uh, I can feel that coming on. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Thank you for sharing your memories and experiences. <sighs> Sorry. <clears throat> now, that was a light one. <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>